Welcome back to Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be discussing the mechanism of long-term potentiation, or LTP, in neurons. To really understand the purpose of long-term potentiation, we really need to understand and think back to the concept of neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity referred to this idea that the brain, really the entire nervous system, is highly plastic, meaning that you can create and grow new neurons, uh, you can also lose neurons, um, you can create connections between neurons, uh, and you can also, on the flip side, lose connections between neurons. But it's not even just that black and white. You can take an existing connection from one neuron to another, and you can strengthen that connection. Long-term potentiation specifically has more to do with strengthening the connections. You're not creating new connections. Creating new connections is what's called synaptogenesis, meaning you're making new synapses. A okay, long-term potentiation is strengthening an existing connection. Uh, the opposite, if you want to weaken one, is called long-term depression, and we'll actually talk about that in a future video, probably the next one actually. So how do we apply long-term potentiation? Well, suppose there's a concept in a class that you're taking, and you really, really need to learn that concept. The instructor's told you it's going to be on the exam. It's going to be like 50% of the exam, maybe. You really need to know this. And then it's also going to be on the final exam, all that good stuff. Whatever that concept might be that you need to learn, you really need to know it. You need to be able to access it quickly, and you need to be able to access it efficiently. Almost like you're thinking about your brain as a bunch of file cabinets, right? And so if this concept that you need to be able to access efficiently represents, let's say, some neural circuit, um, then in order to access it efficiently, you're going to have long-term potentiation of the neurons in that circuit. And so let's now look at the mechanism of long-term potentiation. So long-term potentiation, or LTP, involves postsynaptic strengthening via an increased recruitment of AMPA receptors. So this is all at the molecular level. And when I say strengthening, What's one way we could strengthen a synapse? Well, if all of these right here represent a postsynaptic membrane, we could just put more receptors in the membrane. If there's more receptors in the membrane, then the membrane is going to be more responsive to the same level of neurotransmitter. Versus if you have less receptors, it's going to be less receptive to the same level of neurotransmitter. So one way we can strengthen the connection between this postsynaptic cell right here and a hypothetical presynaptic cell up here, we can strengthen the synapse by adding more receptors into the membrane. And that's what long-term potentiation involves. And it's really going to involve recruitment of these receptors called AMPA receptors. Now, we need to talk about the two kinds of receptors here. We have AMPA receptors. When you have a fairly weak or maybe even a baseline synapse, there's not really a lot of AMPA receptors in the postsynaptic membrane of the dendrite right here. This is actually a dendritic spine or a dendrite. So there's not a lot of AMPA receptors here. Instead, they kind of lie out here in the periphery. And out here where you see this A, this is an AMPA receptor. Uh, the AMPA receptor is not able to respond to neurotransmitter because in this picture I've drawn, the synapse is actually right here. This is the part of the postsynaptic membrane uh, that's going to be responsive to the neurotransmitter. When the AMPA receptors are out here, uh, they're not going to be responsive. And so we need to somehow get AMPA receptors from here and move them somewhere into this membrane. So hopefully that makes sense. This N right here is an NMDA receptor. This is a glutamate receptor. So glutamate can bind to it and activate it, and it will allow calcium influx. Okay? Uh, these NMDA receptors are going to be by default in the postsynaptic membrane right here, where they can respond to glutamate. Also understand that AMPA receptors are also glutamate sensitive. They're glutamate receptors, just like NMDA. However, NMDA allow calcium influx, whereas AMPA receptors allow sodium influx. But think about it this way. Either way, if you put calcium into the cell, or sodium into the cell, you're still depolarizing that cell. Okay, And so if we have increased depolarization, that's going to be, be an increased activity of the postsynaptic neuron. And the more depolarization that we have in this cell, that's telling the brain, more or less, that we need to use this cell a lot. We need to use this neural circuit a lot. So if this neural circuit represents the concept that you need to learn more efficiently, okay, then you're going to be getting a lot of depolarization of this because you're using it a lot. 
right? Okay, so we're going to somehow have to get these APA receptors into uh, the postsynaptic membrane right here of the dendrite. This first picture right here really more or less represents what we have at baseline. So we don't have a whole lot of calcium influx associated with this NMDA receptor. There's some, but there's not a lot. And so when there's not a lot of calcium influx, this protein right here called calmodulin kinase 2, or CAMK2, this protein remains inactive. Okay. We'll talk about what happens when it becomes active later. But this protein right here, calmodulin kinase 2, is going to have to have calcium, a lot of it, to become activated. Okay. Also at baseline, this protein right here, PIN1, is active. Okay. PIN1's activity, when it is active, is to inhibit the translation of this PKM zeta mRNA into its protein form. Okay, so remember our, our gene expression. So if we have an mRNA, uh, it'll bind to a ribosome and with the help of a whole bunch of other factors, uh, we'll get the mRNA translated into a protein. So if we have a PKM zeta mRNA, translation would give us the protein PKM zeta. Well, PIN1, when it's activated, inhibits that translation. And so notice here, we don't actually have this protein PKM zeta. This is really what we have at baseline. We have an inactive calmodulin kinase 2, we have an active PIN1, and then we don't have any protein PKM zeta because its translation is being inhibited by PIN1. Now, why is this PKM zeta important? Well, PKM zeta is important because it's going to be this protein that's a master regulator of getting these AMPA receptors into this postsynaptic membrane. As long as there's no PKM zeta, AMPA receptors are going to stay out here. Okay? So now, here's a neuron. We're using it a lot because this neuron is in that circuit right? that's representing a concept that you really need to be able to recall efficiently for your exam. So you're using this neuron a lot. And so this glutamate right here, there's a lot of this glutamate. There's a lot of binding to this NMDA receptor. And so there's a lot of calcium influx. And so if you're using this neuron and this entire neural circuit a lot, there's a lot of calcium here in the cytoplasm of the dendrite right here uh, near the postsynaptic membrane. And so now with this calcium that's influxed into the cell, calcium can now activate calmodulin kinase 2. Okay? Because remember, calcium is necessary for this protein's activation. Now, what is calmodulin kinase's action here? Well, its function is to actually inhibit PIN1. It turns out calmodulin kinase is a kinase, so it'll phosphorylate PIN1, which inactivates PIN1. Okay? So we now have an inhibited PIN1, or inactivated, I should say. Now, PIN1's normal action when it was activated over here was to inhibit the translation of PKM zeta mRNA into protein. Well now calmodulin kinase 2 has inhibited PIN1. So PIN1 is no longer able to inhibit this translation process. And so now with a lot of calcium here in the cytoplasm and calmodulin kinase 2 activity, now PKM zeta mRNA is able to be translated into its protein PKM zeta. And PKM zeta is the master regulator of long-term potentiation because it's going to be able to indirectly get AMPA receptors to move from this area over here directly into the area where we have the synapse, the postsynaptic membrane. How does it do that? Well, PKM zeta is able to activate this other protein called NSF. And kind of what NSF does is it kind of moves around and it kind of picks up the AMPA receptor, and then it kind of just drags the AMPA receptor up into the correct position. That's sort of what NSF does. And it's going to do this uh, multiple times. And this is actually a graded type of response. It's not all or nothing. So here we have a little bit of calcium influx, and we get a little bit of AMPA receptor migration into the postsynaptic membrane. But if we had a lot of calcium influx, we might get a whole bunch of AMPA receptors here into the membrane. And the more AMPA receptors you have, the more glutamate sensitivity you have, and the more activation you can have of this neuron in the circuit, because it's more sensitive to glutamate. Think about it. If you have more receptors to glutamate, you're going to have a cell that's more sensitive and more efficient at transmitting action potentials.
So hopefully that makes sense. Now just remember with these NMDA receptors, uh, the cell doesn't really change the number of NMDA receptors that much. Okay? There's sort of a, a regular baseline level of these. So the way that it modulates the activity of the postsynaptic membrane is to just get more AMPA receptors into the membrane. And the reverse is also true, which we'll talk about in the next video. If you're not stimulating this neuron a lot, you can actually go the reverse direction and these AMPA receptors will actually go back um, into this area over here where they cannot be sensitive to glutamate. They're not in the synapse. So the reverse is also true. That's called long-term depression, but we'll cover that in the next video. So the gist of this is, if you start depolarizing one of these neurons a lot, that tells the brain that you're using this neuron a lot. Okay? And so if you're using it a lot, it ought to increase the number of receptors in the membrane because it's going to make it more sensitive and make it more efficient. Think about it. If you're using that neuron a lot because you need to recall that concept a lot, you want that process to be fast and you want it to be efficient. And this process that I've just described to you is long-term potentiation. The main thing to notice here is that we're not getting new synapses. Okay? We're not getting synaptogenesis. Okay? All we're doing is we're strengthening a pre-existing synapse. And again, I mentioned this, but it, there is a presynaptic neuron up here. Okay? I just haven't shown it for obvious reasons because all the events here are taking place at the postsynaptic membrane. So hopefully this video made sense and gave you a good understanding of long-term potentiation. In the next video, we'll be discussing the mechanism of long-term depression, and you'll find that it's actually very similar. It pretty much is just the reverse process. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.